The highlight. For $35, Solid Gold gives you over $10,000 in discounts. Now you get more. Good at more than 200 restaurants with more action sports coupons, more year-round packages, better skiing discounts, and more entertainment value. Solid Gold. Solid Gold. You heard it. Available throughout the Lower Mainland from any sponsoring charity or service organization. Good morning, it's that time of the year again, and there's major flooding in Pemberton, Squamish, etc., as if we didn't expect it. And in the helicopter over the area of the flooding is Steve Wyatt uh, in the BCTV News Hour helicopter. Steve, what's the score this morning after such heavy rain for the last few days? Well, that's a very clear your throat again, Steve, and try once more. Where are you, Steve? Well, Steve, <laughs> I'm not at a loss for words, but what I'll do is I'll put you back on hold and I'll hang up on you so you can call again and one of my intrepid staff here can get you on the phone and we'll use you before we come up for the break. And this morning we've been all set, and we are all set actually, for a shortened but very bright program. Because the story that caught my attention most of all over the weekend was the one about the Capilano, the Squamish Indian Band, denying white fishermen their inalienable right to fish on the Capilano River. And in the studio to explain the official position and tell what's ahead is Chief Joe Mathias of the Squamish Indian Band and David Jacobs, the chairman of the Band Council and chairman of their fisheries committee. And we're going to find out what's happening over there and if we can dare go and catch a salmon other than off the beach at Ambleside. And then, of course, following up last week's news <laughs> with this week's development, I've got to refer back to Bill van der Zam. In with both feet, I think, to become mayor of Vancouver, get rid of Harcourt and his lefty friends. But to remind you of some of the provocative things that Mr. van der Zam said, first look at this little clip from Webster of last week about lefties. Well, uh, you know there are too many lefties on council, and not only left, they're so far left you can hardly find them. So them. we, we mm. hope to... Uh, Name the ones that are so far left you can hardly well, find them. You, you know, that's, I suppose, I don't know how many of them have membership in the Communist Party, but One. you know Bruce York does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll get down to Casey's with the lefties on council and see what the record looks like. And, of course, here as the chief lefty is Alderman Harry Rankin who will defend his political position to the death, but still doesn't mind what van der Zam says. With him, too, of course, as a staunch member of COP, is Bruce Erickson. I don't think Libby's here this morning, just the one half of the Erickson family, Alderman Bruce Erickson. And I think we may have Steve Wyatt here. Do we have Steve Wyatt? Are you there now, Steve? Jack. What's the score this morning? Where are you in the helicopter? Jack, right now we're flying over the town of Pemberton, where the situation is actually much worse than it was yesterday, as we saw in the news. The Lillooet River has flooded even more. Most of the town, except for the tiny portion on the side of a hill, which is downtown, is not covered by water. The uh, school nearby downtown is completely submerged. As a matter of fact, the school bus was abandoned out front and is submerged to its rooftop. People we have seen have been walking along the railroad tracks, which are high enough not to be covered as yet walking back to their homes and also canoeing away from their homes. But the situation is much worse than it, is, it was yesterday. Is it still raining heavily? I'm afraid it's a one-way phone call. Steve, we'll have you later on to give us an update. And I'll be back with a lefty look at the council and bulletins from Steve as the occasion warrants it after the break. Special to say, I think I just won on my program. 
Anyway, over and out. Um, before I start interviewing my two lefty guests uh, who really run Vancouver City Council, despite what Harcourt says, I want you to get it in perspective by seeing the 60 second clip from Van der Zam of last week. Do you approve of the fact that the Civic Council declared that Vancouver is a nuclear free city? Well, they've declared Vancouver is a nuclear free city. They now have a plebiscite. Uh, on the go for uh, uh, cruise missiles testing. To stop cruise missile testing. That's right. And there's a motion before council that Vancouver be declared a battleship free zone so that the Canadian Navy can't enter the harbor. All right, tell me first, what do you think of the nuclear free city declaration? Well, you know, you can't be against a nuclear freeze. You can't be against nuclear weapons, against war. You can't be but for peace. But to try and con the people to say that every council meeting somehow must get involved in these issues and that we, the Council of Vancouver, can resolve all of these world prob problems and deal with it not nationally, but right here in Vancouver City Council Chamber, that's a con job. And here are two of the men accused of this particular type of political con job. Shall I call you comrade this morning, Alderman Rankin? If you feel like it and it will make your program, after all, that's part of the game, isn't it? That I make a program for you and you in return put me on the air. But if I were to call you comrade, that would indicate that you are a member of the Communist Party. No, or the Canadian Legion. And One or the other. But are you a member of the Communist Party? No. I see this not red baiting, no. but merely to set Mr. Van der Zam right. Well, yeah, but it must be red baiting. It's been asked about 250 times. Well, did and you... the, you've had the answer 250 <laughs> times. So really, it becomes like tell me that old old story. But is it not a fact that you are not a member of the NDP? That's a fact as well. Because it's too far to the right for you. It is too far to the right for me in most ways. Yes, that's right. Which political party do you belong to? I don't belong to anybody uh, except Cope in the civic field. And that's all? That's right. Well, now, Comrade Erickson, may I call you Comrade Erickson with, uh, veris, with accuracy? Well, that's what all the people at the Army and Navy and Air Force veterans call me. You don't go into these pubs, do you? Oh, certainly, certainly. But you don't drink if you go in? <clears throat> yes, I have a beer. Okay. And which political party are you a member of? <clears throat> the NDP. Are you welcome in the NDP? Oh, you bet. Uh, we have four NDP members on the council, as a matter of fact. Four? Who's that? Erickson, Davies, Yee, and Harcourt. Your wife is a member of the NDP? Yes, yes. Long Davies, time. Yee is a member of the NDP? Yes. That's five and all, isn't it? No, that's Oh, no, Erickson, Davies, G, and Harcourt. Just take your thumb and put it to one oh, side, oh, and you'll be able to get there. <laughs> Erickson, Davies. Or get your little adding machine out. G and Harcourt. Yeah. Who else is there? Mm. No other members of the NDP? Except the... On the, council. You run council, don't you? You <laughs> take, you lead Harcourt around by the nose, don't well, you? Well, the problem is, you know, you, you get into this uh, political uh, party bit. On council, we... Uh, vote on the basis of our election platform, uh, unlike our other uh, or our op opponents who vote on the basis of the social credit party policies. You know, we're the real nonpartisans. <laughs> Let's get down to cases. I have uh, in front of me ten international peace type motions. Yes. Introduced by mostly by your group. Yes. Uh, nuclear disarmament, peace appeal from Hiroshima. Canada and nuclear weapon free zone, a peace walk, nuclear weapon free zone for Vancouver, opposing the testing of cruise missile, that signs about nuclear about free zone or yes, be in Vancouver, a Canada peace camp for Canadian American and Soviet mothers, a, against testing of cruise missile and the peace walk. Yes. How much time did you waste with these ineffective motions which merely got you headlines and did absolutely no well, good in the world scene? First of all, we didn't waste any time. We did all our council business, and that is council business. Those motions, most of them, are voted across the board. NPA, team, COPE, and the NDP or independents voted for them. Usually one or two against seven, usually nine to two or eight to three. Secondly, uh, unlike a lot of people. I've had a very first-hand experience with war. Most people in this country, luckily for them, haven't. And I think that it's one of the most important things we do is to focus on the fact 
that a third world war would be the end of our civilization. I'm even prepared to assist Mr. Vandersam to live his life out and to die of old age on the basis that I have to do that in order to look after everybody else. If Van der Zand were to become mayor, could he prevent the presentation of such motions? No, he couldn't because he'd have one vote like everybody else. But the, th that isn't really the point. Uh, you see, he thinks that by sort of red-baiting on these things, he thinks that by discouraging them, by telling people that they're stupid and everything else, and only the people in Ottawa have sufficient intelligence to deal with the subject, he would discourage a lot of people from participating. Okay. Now, if we're going to save the world, it will be the people who have to die and have to fight the wars that will save it. It will not be the leaders without a lot of encouragement from the bottom up. But the, the final straw which broke Van der Zam's camel back is apparently your proposition to make Vancouver a battleship free zone and prevent American warships coming into the harbor. I never heard of that motion, I've never seen it. I don't know where he got it, but uh, you know, uh, he says a lot of things that aren't quite true. You mean that's a lot of nonsense? Straight nonsense. You know, if you don't live in the city of Vancouver, you have no idea what's going on in council. Uh, you listen to rumors and you pass them on as truth. Did you not have something about the against an American warship coming in? No, no, no. Have you any plans for a motion to make Vancouver Harbor a battleship free zone? <laughs> well, we can't to start off with. The fact is that uh, the federal uh, government runs our harbors. So uh, he's full of wind on that one. That's right. And, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, he doesn't uh, uh, tell the general public is that even his leader, Comrade Bennett, uh, wrote a letter to the peace movement uh, and I'll tell you he, he pointed out that uh, Comrade Bennett wrote to the peace movement yes and he said and he said to the peace movement I join you in spirit today and the government of BC adds its voice to yours let there be peace let us avoid the horrors of nuclear holocaust and he pointed out that the legislature in the unanimous vote mm -hmm had asked all world governments to increase their efforts to end that's the nuclear enough, arms enough. race. We've all but had anyway, that right, and that's a good statement from Mr. Bennett. Are you and praising I think, I think he should be complimented for that's that right. statement because that statement means that a second level of government has made those declarations. Now, as far as the harbor is concerned, if all countries kept their nuclear arms home, their navies would be welcomed all over the world as peace missions. And the fact is, that is an important issue. Mm -hmm. And to sort of just, you know, be, uh, you say, lefties or anything else, you know, surely he doesn't think I want to be called a right-winger. You don't mind being called a lefty. I want to be known as what I am. I've never tried to sail under false colors. You know, if being right is being like Mr. Van Der Zam, I want to be as far away from that as I can. You want to be so far away yeah. he can't even see you or hear you. Or well, you want him to be look, so far away. I don't away. mind talking to him. I don't mind discussing things. What do you think of him? In a personal sense? Yeah. He's a charming enough man in Describe the personal his sense. politics. His politics are kind of a Christian fascism. Uh, He's a very, very dangerous man politically. Individually, I have nothing against him at all. Uh, I, I can talk with him and... Uh, do you think uh, he knows anything? Uh, not much, because if he did, he would keep his mouth shut a lot more. More with Erickson and Rankin. I'm going to do a short piece on issues, specific issues, and then I want, because my full shot and program this morning, I want to get the phone call soon for friends and enemies of comrades Rankin, uh, Erickson, and Webster. After the break. <laughs> What apologies have you got to make for the performance of Vancouver City Council? But well, let me start with questions. Was it a bribe? The question of cleaning up that mess in Shaughnessy Heights. You got hell for that from the Vancouver Sun and whatnot, but Harcourt came here and said that the reporting by the press was totally inaccurate on the final disposal of the $500,000 you took from somebody, is that right? That's right. All right, give me a succinct summary of that to prove that you were right in taking what was described as a bribe. Well, first of all, a bribe is something you put in your own pocket. It's something that the, is strictly a legal matter. You put it in your own pocket. We put it in the social housing fund. $500,000 because they had overbuilt on that site. There was a simple choice. Tear down four good units or take 
all the profit out of it and say, don't overbuild again. It wasn't zoning, it was overbuilding. Something that happens in this city all the time. They could have done it the right way, gone to the Board of Variance, got their overbuilding. They didn't do it. They played their little games and it cost them $500,000 to do it. And it wasn't a bribe, it went into the social housing fund. Well, this man, Richie, Municipal Affairs Minister, still, I think, said something about changing the charter so you couldn't do it again. Mr. Ritchie can change the charter if he wishes. It would probably never happen again. It didn't happen once before in my 18 years, and it didn't happen on this occasion. The question of changing the charter is a different matter. Mr. Ritchie's reason for changing the charter is like Mr. Van Der Zandt's, to centralize things in Victoria. There has never been a member of council in my lifetime ever charged or even suspected in the 18 years there of any criminal offense. There have been four of them in Victoria. Four? Char three charged and one a recommended charge. Cabinet minister went to jail. Another guy was a, a theft. A another guy fraud. Another guy recommended that he be charged and no charge laid. The, the RCMP recommended. That's right. That the was minister, Richie. The minister of municipalities. So uh, don't tell me about bribes. A bribe is when you take money and you put it into your pocket. All right, what about this scandal up at City Hall? One man was fired. Has that been cleaned up? Yes, and as a matter of fact, all of those things started a long time before we got on a council, and this council... Doesn't matter what started before this council, you go on council. This council has cleaned them up. We, we've taken a very close look at uh, well, the things department, that Well, that department, what here. was that, building permits? Yeah. And that must have been in a terrible mess. Well... For it's, many years. It's the kind of place where if you're going to have trouble, that's where it'll happen. But you know, you have 5,000 employees and you have two cases, one of theft of funds mm. and one of uh, handing out permits and favors. That's not a bad record. There are an honest, hardworking bunch of civil servants there and the two that went cleaned up whatever mess I was forgot there. though, there was another case of a house which was vastly overbuilt. Can that, that guy now get off the hook eventually by giving money to council? Absolutely <laughs> not, because he is in breach of the zoning bylaws, and when it's through in the courts, and I think it will be through in our favor, because the decision already is in our favor, that house will be back to the limits that are allowed for that particular It'll house. be reconstructed, is that right? That's right. In some way. Okay, now, you're the chairman of the Finance Committee, uh, and you have not followed social credit restraint, have you? You haven't laid off a single soul. We have not laid off a single soul. Our budget is balanced. Our tax increase was around 3.5%, which is about a quarter of what the provincial government tax increase is. And I think that that's a fairly good record. The services in the city of Vancouver are being maintained at the standards of 1984. And I think people are very content with that kind of. And a as long as Cope controls council or has enough votes, which you have at the moment, don't you? You've got control of council. We have uh, six votes on most important issues. There such will as never be any non-union contract awarded by Vancouver City Hall. Is that correct? We haven't said that at all. Well, we'll say it. Will you ever award that? Will you, Eric's, never recommend a non-union contract be accepted at Vancouver City Hall? I don't get to make the recommendations. Oh, you've got to have a position on that. Are you telling me that you might vote for a non-union contract? You? <coughs> I can give you an example. You're where rescuing them. No, I'm, just let me give you, because I deal with most of those things. In the case of the community centre in Dunbar, there was $500,000 provincial money, and basically it was a Parks Board contract. But the fact of the matter is, if we had voted a union contract, we would have, in fact, lost the $500,000 for the community center. Uh, there was no way we could do that. So there will be cases where non-union contracts will come in because we have no control of it. Our policy is union contracts wherever possible because the fact of the matter is that maintains working men's standards in the city and what has been played off against us on many occasions is the kind of contract that comes in $40,000 less than a union contract and the wages are about two thirds or less than a union contract. So the only conclusion you can draw is that where that happens, the boss is taking a million dollars profit, the workers are getting next to nothing and have no purchasing power, so obviously we're for union contracts by and large. If Van der Zandt were elected, you couldn't even work with them, could you? you? You and your wife Libby, who's also on council. By the way, how much do you get in total salary a year between the two of you? Total salary, I think about 40000 yeah. 20000 apiece? Yeah. You couldn't even sit in the same council room as, as, uh, as Van der Zandt after some of the 
trouble you've given them. Remember you used your baby's mm. diaper to insult them? <laughs> well, first of all, I didn't use my baby's diaper to insult Mr. Vanders. Is my I'm memory wrong? Yes, it is, because uh, uh, you people have the habit of uh, uh, <coughs> misreading what happens. The diapers were, just a second, the diapers were given as a gift to uh, Alderman Davies and I, uh, and uh, BC Television wanted to come down and look at the diapers. But uh, we didn't buy the diapers, and we didn't use them for an insult. They were given to us as a gift. As to Mr. Van Der Zam and whether we can work with him, if he's elected, we will have to work with him. We work with uh, the other members of the NPA on council now, and if you look at what's happening on council, you'll find that there is a hell of a lot of unanimous motions. We work in the interest of the overall population of the city and not on narrow lines of us versus them. Okay. And let me make it fairly simple. If the public elects whoever they decide, whether they elect me or don't elect me, let's assume they elect me and all the others were something of another party. I work as hard as I can because that's what the public did. They elected them. And my job then, whether it's Mr. Bennett and Victoria or anybody else, is to work as hard as we Again. can to advance our policies and, and work with them. And the thing that having known you all these years since you were a, a, a rumpled law student, you know, yeah. making your first dollar, whatever it was, and here, we'll both end our careers one of these years without you having guts enough to run for mayor. That must break your heart, Harry Rankin. I'll tell you something, that is not really the issue at all. The issue is that I have helped build COPE into an organization that's viable and has some impact on council, not as advancing my own fortunes independent of something else. And if the occasion arises, I think I've still got a few more years. You may be at the end of your career, you're 64. Old. That's right. I said you may be at the end of your career You're 64. And old, but I am not at the end of my career. Old, yes, but not at the end of my career. Okay, Couldn't, Carl. By a long shot. Couldn't he run when he's 66? No, I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, calls now to Reagan. I don't need a prompter like Regan. Well, I don't know. I've never seen you shut up, though. I must confess. You've That's talked right. on endlessly about uh, nothing you've mentioned to me. And probably fairly mm. ably on most things. On most things, yes. Little yes. pompous nowadays. Oh, you know, maybe I find so. you're getting more pompous as you get older. Uh, but, you know, you aren't exactly <laughs> devoid of pompousness. You've deflated yourself a little bit in weight, but not pomposity. Uh, calls to Erickson and Rankin. Brothers Zerix, comrades Erickson and Rankin. After the break. This is not a committee to re-elect Cope. I stand always securely in the middle of the fence, just like Mayor Harcourt with my feet on both sides. And the iron entering your soul. <laughs> Go ahead to Rankin and Don Erickson. Well, good morning to all of you gentlemen there. And uh, I just wanted to offer my uh, support um, uh, to Mr. Rankin and Mr. Erickson and to you, Jack. And I I'm not nothing to do with them. I know, but I, I won't know be you're seen probably in, not for nuclear. I won't be seen in public with them. Pardon? I won't be seen in public except on television with them. That's your problem. You own that problem. Okay, um, I just wanted to say, um, I think it's a good idea that we have Vancouver a nuclear weapons freeze. Zone. Thank you, thank you. Enough time. And on a that sensible call, idea, too. Go ahead, please. Oh, uh, Harry? Yes? I think you've been around long enough. I think you should take your million and retire. Well, I haven't got a million. Uh, I don't intend to retire. And if you've got some question, I don't mind answering it. It sounds like you've been around a little too long. Well, you seem, I've been you've been be, seem a little time, bit bored. Buddy, and I've seen you down at city council, and I'm tired of all that nattering. Thank you. He doesn't like you. I, th I think I'm getting th that message through somehow. A uh, fine call that was. Go ahead, please. Hello? That's you, sir. Yes, Mr. Rankin. Yes? Uh, I believe it was Adam Smith said about uh, 100 years before the United States became a country that these truths we hold to be self-evident, that all men were endowed with the inalienable right of life, liberty, and property. Under life, liberty. our Constitution, we cannot hold property. Do you agree that people of Vancouver and Canada should not hold property? I very much believe in owning property, a personal piece of property. And the other day, the uh, real estate board had something on. They wanted private property week. 
And I got up in council and suggested, does that mean there'll be no foreclosures? Does that mean if you get a judgment against your home, it can't be sold? Does that mean when the ALRT comes through 12 foot from your bedroom that you can't get a decent deal from the provincial government? You see, these generalized statements about owning property mean nothing if you get fired out of your job and the bank forecloses. So I'm very much for a person owning their own piece of property. As a matter of fact, I've owned a house, or me and the bank, collectively, uh, them with the biggest interest all my life, and I like the idea of having a house. So but I don't like I don't like the generalizations no. about owning property when it has no base or no meaning about it. While not impugning your your virginal political motives, you have all your life been a successful businessman, if not entrepreneur and capitalist under the system. I have been successful, but if I hadn't been, I'd be pilloried for not being successful. But I'll You'd tell you this much, I don't have a million dollars. I have to work every day in order to maintain my property and self like anybody else, and I don't mind it. I like to work. Let Bruce get a word in, please. Uh, all right. You? I, I'm it's finished. okay. It's okay. We'll go, go ahead, fine. please. Is that me, Jack? That's you. Oh, I'm sorry. I had three questions, if you don't mind, and I'll hang up. Yeah. The first one is on the housing bit, uh, which I phoned you about, and where Mayor Harcourt said that there wasn't enough to take the man to jail, or to take him to trial, pardon me. The second one... I'll take him to trial. I'll, tell, I'll explain that to you. Oh, Two... Housing bit, where you took the fine. The second one was the... Uh, had I known when I was voting there, I don't live there anymore, but had I known that... Uh, Mr. Erickson and, and the lady were the same. I would have changed, but of course I wanted NDP in. The third thing is, I just wondered, I haven't heard you mention it, but I, I, I was listening on the, the radio the other day, because you weren't on, and uh, when this Italian senator, or Italian-born senator, pardon me, I'd be careful what I say, and I listened to a man say about if you had anything to go to, that was kind of gripes, you went to this guy, and if you had some kind of disease, you went to Dr. Fox, and I don't know whether you caught that. No, I don't understand that either. I've got your first two questions. Uh, there had been mention of a suspect who wasn't charged in the building permits caper. That's all, and you told me earlier there was not sufficient proof to charge anyone. That's right, there wasn't sufficient proof, and the police said there isn't, you know, what do you, what do, you do? You expect you accept the word of the people that investigate that there's a not enough evidence for a charge. Yeah, but in brutal free enterprise, what you do is you'd fire the guy and say, if you think we're wrong, sue us. We did fire him. That's one. That's the one. That was the only one. That's the only one. That's All right. right. The other we one was... We fired him and we didn't give him one dime, damages or anything else. The other one was that had he known that you and Libby were a husband and wife team, he wouldn't have voted and he wouldn't mm. have voted for you. Well, that's, uh, I don't understand that because the Vancouver Sun, the province, uh, just about every newspaper and radio station discussed that issue, and we discussed it at every all-candidates meeting during the last election. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I'm a citizen of Vancouver, and I've never been to city, uh, I've never spoke before city council, but the reason uh, uh, some of these questions of other issues being discussed in front of our city council is they're about the last level of government that's going to listen to us. I think it's important that uh, people have a place that they can go and they can talk about concerns they have in their community. I mean, when Van Der Zand was in the provincial government, it was not very approachable. Uh, if he was mayor of Vancouver, again, Vancouver City Council wouldn't be approachable. And I sort of like uh, Cope's position of letting people come before City Council with reasonable issues, with, with well thought out issues. And uh, I just want to thank Cope for continuing okay. that. Okay, that's enough. All right, Don't and, say that, and no, let me say something. Well, if there were an NPA council elected, because I was there, one person with ten others. Oh, I remember. It, it took, it took. It was easier to see the Queen of England than it was to see the city council. That's go, a fact. Go and ahead. I would please. go back to that again. And the Pope would have been a walk away compared. That's to That's right. Much more accessible. You better believe it. Who was the mayor then? Do you remember? Well, there was Campbell at that time. Terrific Tom. Rathy, Rathy. was even worse and more autocratic. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. I uh, certainly will not be voting for Mr. Van Der Zam because uh, I don't think he's looking out for the uh, uh, democratic principles that are involved, uh, especially when Vancouverites vote uh, for a ward system and he doesn't... Oh, yeah. Good point. Hold on, please. Did you or did you not, Mr. Erickson, call Van der Zam a very nasty name? What was it? 
You called him a little dictator. <clears throat> yes. A yes. nitty. Yes. As a matter of fact, I could just see it now. You elect Van Der Zam in an NPA majority, uh, the first thing they do is lay off uh, five or six hundred staff and then tell them they're lazy bums because they weren't working. And that's basically what the sort of uh, approach he takes to people. And the ward system. What would happen to the ward system, your, your dream, if he became mayor of Vancouver? Well, there certainly wouldn't be a ward system. His colleagues in Victoria have already told us there's no way. But does he have colleagues in Victoria or do they hate his guts? Because remember when he chickened out, he thought Barrett was going to win the election and he was going to go for the leadership we suspected? Oh, I don't have any doubt that uh, he was sim swimming away from the sinking ship. But that's like a, a captain that abandons with the crew too soon and the ship sails off and somebody salvages it. All right. He miscalculated. Give me, but, give you know, you can't blame the fellow for trying. What are these motives in running? You're not shy about other people's motives because they're not shy about yours. Well, uh, I hesitate to ascribe motives to other people. Uh, Don't unless, hesitate. Unless I have some clear evidence of it. Don't hesitate. I think he has a very, very profound need to be back in the limelight. I don't think he's very welcome in Victoria. There's not much space in Ottawa because by the time Mulroney kicks out all his liberals and replaces them with, you know, the, the conservatives, He's got to look after his friends there, so there's not very much space well, right Well, gentlemen, now. we shall see you on, what is it they call it, Quintly, the Hustings? That's right. And Libby will come the next time. This I'll, is I'll the tell Hustings you what, for you me. Know, as far as Van Der Zam having support from the Social Credit Party, if he's running for the NPA, he is obviously going to get every bit of support they can. The total NPA slate is pure social credit, including the... Can he win? Include, no, he can't. Including can he the win? vice president. I don't the, think so. Will he get I, a good vote? I don't think so. Will he get a good vote? I think he'll get a vote. I, I think the city will divide those that are going to vote for him, know it right now. Gentlemen, and we'll, those that aren't also we'll, we'll right have now. all of you back, even if the listeners don't want to see the Vancouver Civic election to get down to the nub of the crisis in time, though people can make up their minds in a truly democratic and fully informed manner. You By bet. when is the election? November 17th. I'm glad I know the day. It's a Saturday. Next, yep. uh, we're going to talk about the problem of white men not being allowed to fish in the Capilano River. <laughs> and I've got Joe Mathias and David Jacobs here to tell us a sad and tough tale after the break. Now, to be quite serious about this subject, Joe Mathias is chief of the Squamish Band, and David Jacobs is the chairman of the band council. Now, I got the feeling that there's a very delicate situation over involving the fishing on the Capilano River, especially now that they're going up in droves. Are they going up or coming down? Going up. Going up in droves. Just briefly, before we do anything else, let's look at the map, and perhaps you can explain to me what the actual <coughs> territorial imperatives are over here. Now. What's that land within the dotted line on the coast, uh, within the dotted line on the coast? That seems to go from east of the Capilano River onto the lands which are returned to you at Ambleside. Is that correct? That is the cutoff lands that was returned to the Squamish Band. That's right. So that land, including the waterfront there, is, belongs to the Squamish Indian Band. Is that correct? That's correct. Is there any place when did you lay down the law, as I believe you're entitled to, the white men would not fish there? Well, I think there's something that should be cleared up here. Uh, the fact is that we're living under a statute, a federal statute called the Federal Indian Act. Section 30 of the Indian Act uh, is the trespass provisions. Under these trespass provisions, uh, we have the authority, and the federal government has the authority, to prevent uh, anyone from trespassing on Indian land. Uh, it's Indian land, it's in essence, it's private land. So when the uh, cutoff lands was returned to us, including the bed of the river, the Capilano River, uh, that land became uh, Squamish reserve land. Therefore, Section 30 of the Indian Act applies. The trespass provisions have been in place for some 100 years. So it's always been there. Yeah, but now it's been clearly, let me go to David in this. Now, it's, we're going to look at that map again shortly. I, I kind of fouled up the cameras there, my mistake. Uh, 
that land is now clearly an area around the waters of Capilano where only Indians have the legal entitlement to fish. That's correct. We've, uh, under the, uh, as Joel mentioned, the, the land is now titled, is owned by the, the Squamish Band. We have a bylaw, bylaw number 10, which permits members of the Squamish Band to fish on that river. And that's the only one, the only people who are allowed to fish on the river. Now, when I get the map back again, which we'll do after the break, I want you to show me where non-Indians may fish legally when the salmon are running. There are a couple of areas, are there not? The beach at Ambleside, are they entitled to use the foreshore at Ambleside? As long as it's beyond the reserve. As long as it's beyond the cut-off land returned to us. It's ours. But no, I thought the, the, the median high water mark was always public on all coastal lands in Canada. Mm. Well, the, the part of the settlement is a straight-line survey that uh, goes right across the waterfront. And uh, by going across the waterfront, there's a small tip at the mouth of the river which is not part of the cutoff land settlement. And that small tip is, uh, I guess you would say, public land. That's the only one that's public land? At this point in time, yes. All right, now what happens, what are the restrictions on your fishing? Because when we saw that clip this morning, you could see people just, they're <coughs> not fishing for them. What are they doing, gaffing them? J they're jigging. Huh? Jigging. Jigging. Well, gaffing. Can you jig or gaff unlimitedly without the requirement of throwing in a line? Under our bylaw, we, uh, the band council, can permit our band members to fish on Squamish rivers. Capilano is not only is only one of our rivers. Uh, we, under our bylaw, we can allow our band members to fish under any method that we so decide. Uh, in other words, there is a prohibitive prohibition section whereby we can uh, close the river for a day. We can close the river for a week. Uh, we can prevent our fishermen, our Indian fishermen, from using a net, set nets. We can prevent them from using explosives. We can prevent them from gaffing or jigging. But uh, under our bylaw, it's permissible for our people to fish on the rivers under any method until the band council sets in a policy to prevent a particular method. All right, how many fish will you take on this run? Will you fish in an unlimited, unrestricted fashion? Well, no, uh, Jack. The, um, the counts that we have today um, indicates about 2,000 salmon, which we have taken over the, uh, since the runs have started in uh, mid-August. Uh, mid Can you sell those fish? Um, we, or do you sell we, those we fish? We encourage our people. Um, it is a fishery bylaw, and our people uh, mainly keep the food for self-sustenance. Uh, we freeze the food for winters. Um, there have been some people who have um, sold fish, but that it is strictly, I, I believe there was a court case recently which permit our people to sell the fish. I can go over there today to the Squamish Band, can I, Joe? And buy myself some salmon at a good rate if I can get one from one of your band members. Well, you're raising an issue uh, <clears throat> that's a loaded issue. Why is it loaded? Um, because we're in a conflict with the Department of Fisheries. Uh, all fishery, Indian fishery up and down the coast we are, under, we are under harassment with the Department of Fisheries. So when you're talking about catching of Indian food fish and Indian people selling that Indian food fish, we run into two different jurisdictions. I've got it. The food fish is totally used to do as you wish with which, and it would be presumed you only caught sufficient for food purpose until the next run. That's right. So that's, there's no argument about your jurisdiction in food fish. No argument. But uh, the federal fisheries seem to accuse you of bootlegging and a criminal offense should you sell that fish, for instance, to a restaurant in Calgary or in downtown Vancouver. That's, that's the running battle that we're having with the Department of Fisheries. Oh. Basically, it's a conflict of Indian jurisdiction over Indian land and rivers as opposed to a federal department called the Department of Fisheries who are trying to impose Fisheries regulations on Indians, Indian food fisheries. But an unwise band or a badly managed band could fish out, could net out, could blow out the whole future of any given river, couldn't it? Well, I, Jack... Why shouldn't you be under federal control for the actual catch? Well, I believe uh, Joe had mentioned earlier that under the, the Indian Act permits the band certain jurisdiction, which one of them is... Um, a bylaw which the band has passed uh, for us to preserve and manage the salmon, right. which we have done. Now, 
in your comment of uh, the other bands or band being able to fish out a, a salmon from that river completely, I, I think it's, uh, it goes a little bit further than that, Jack, in that um, if the salmon on its, um, its migration, as you know, goes out to the Bering Sea, and it returns on its way back, and it is in uh, international waters, and he is interrupted by the Japanese fishermen, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Russian fishermen, the American fishermen, Canadian the Canadian food. fishermen, and uh, in the countless thousands of sports fishermen, they're, in, they're intercepted on his way back to the river. Now, what returns to the river, the information we have is 4% of the salmon. Now, that 4% is what really survives th that gauntlet. For the breeding purposes. They, yes, they, they are Okay, going back. hold that there for a moment. This is a fascinating program. I suppose we non-Indians have got to face up the fact of life that the Indian people are now educated, have their rights, and are going to use them to the full. <clears throat> Absolutely. The rights, uh, the Aboriginal rights we're talking about is now constitutionalized. Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution. Fishing rights Very is an Aboriginal right. Very inconvenient. And we have been standing by our rights to fish for our people for as long as 200 years and even before that. So uh, in terms of fishing rights, what we're talking about here is Indian government jurisdiction, Squamish First Nation jurisdiction. We have passed a bylaw. We are exercising jurisdiction over our fishery. After the break. Joe Mathias, Chief of the Squamish Indian Band. David Jacobs is the Chairman of the Band Council. Question. Why is it your... Has there been any awkward incidents between your people, your band fishermen, and the sports fishermen? The good old innocent sports fishermen who's been catching salmon off the mouth and from the sides of the Capilano for a hundred years, would you grant me? Maybe 50? not two, but a hundred. Twenty? Fifty. We'll settle with Ten. 50. <laughs> All right. Are you going to let them fish in there? Well, we're, we're, our band council is addressing this issue regarding uh, sports fishermen. And we haven't come down with a formal uh, public position regarding trespass. When we're talking about trespass for sports fishermen on our land, we're talking about a very serious legal process. And uh, before we uh, charge anybody with trespass, at this point in time, we haven't made that declaration. But if you were a white man, would you go fishing along the banks of the Capilano River just now? No, I wouldn't. Why not? Because it's Indian land. But it's only going to give them trouble. They need Squamish Band permission. Can they get permission? They can, uh, they can apply to the band council. Are you going to give out licenses for white fishermen to fish in the Capilano River. Good question, Webster. Something we're, we're looking at. It's, it's, it's an option. Uh, we haven't come down with a policy on it. You know, you're beginning to sound like a civil servant. First of all, you tell me you're addressing the question. And then you tell me it's an option. Are you considering the issuing of licenses to non-Indian fishermen in the Capilano no. River? No. That's no. better. Yeah. Will you? Can, and you don't fancy it at all, do you? No. Not even as a money-raising proposition? No. Are you going to take steps to keep non-Indian fishermen off the beach at Ambleside to which they can easily walk through what were the cut-off lands? It's almost at the park, isn't it? It it's is. It's your park, isn't it? It's our park. <clears throat> the but you can't stop me going into that park yet, can now, you? Now that the rains have come, the, the, the uh, coho run, spring run, is just about over. It'll be over this weekend. It's not over now. Are you only interested in fishing the big stuff, the big runs? Will you stop nagging the non-Indian fishermen once there are just a few salmon at the mouth of the river? There's very few salmon there when, when, they're, when, they're, when they're not spawning. But Joe, the one thing I want to get clear is, is it your public statement that non-Indian fishermen must not fish the Capilano? That will be our position in council. It's Squamish Indian land. And can you charge people for breaking your bylaw? It's not only our bylaw, but they will be uh, charged with trespass. 
trespass is the charge. Mm -hmm. Can I see that map again, please? I want to get this quite clear. And you'll have to come back anyway to talk more about this because we were squeezed this morning. This is a big story. Okay, finger up there. Point to the one spit of land which uh, uh, Joe tells me is actually beyond the survey line and where a white man can stand and cast his line. Is that it? That's it. That's correct. Mind you, there's nothing to stop him it being in his little boat beyond that survey line which stretches from that tip to Ambleside Beach. Absolutely. There's a large flotilla of sports fishermen at the mouth mm -hmm. of the Kepler River. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want to, nor can you stop people from fishing there? No. Is that right? That's, that's, right. that's correct. It's all, it's all reserved land. But, but Jack, you know, one problem that we're having presently is on the on the west bank of the river there's uh, sports fishermen have been fishing there for, for many many years now as you know the land has just been returned mm -hmm. to the band um, and I suppose the the breakdown is the information that this is Indian land um, so therefore the bylaw uh, takes precedence over the non-Indian fishing there now we have to uh, along with the, the general public on the North Shore is to get that information, what is Indian land, what is not Indian land, what, uh, what rights do the Indians have, what rights that the non-Indian does not have. So we have to get that communication over well, that's across. A, that's what uh, I'm helping you to do this morning for yes, instance, quite like, clearly. Yeah, I like it. Uh, and it's a very tricky situation. Uh, for instance, you could put markers on the Ambleside <clears throat> the cutoff land returned to you and put in a boundary line and say beyond this you cannot go to fish. Absolutely. I wouldn't think that you're going to interfere with public access to that section of Ambleside which includes a little golf course doesn't it? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And the park. Part of the park. The Are you, uh, have you yet negotiated a lease with West Vancouver of what uh, the people who built the park are going to have to pay to use it? Well I'm glad you raised that question because our band council will be meeting quite uh, very shortly this month to uh, consider a package proposal. Uh, once that is adopted by band council, either changed or adopted, uh, we will then be uh, calling a meeting with West Vancouver Council. Okay, well you'll have to come back. Next question, what do you think of the pool expansion? The aquarium for the whales in Stanley Park? The killer whale pool yeah. habitat? Mm -hmm. We're concerned about it, uh, vitally concerned about it, because what they're doing is there's a great possibility that they may disturb and interrupt the uh, Indian village that belongs to us on Lumberman's Arch. If they find the midden, you'll use it as evidence? Absolutely. It belongs to us. We went it through does this. not belong to a museum. We went through this once before. We're going to go through it again. The artifacts? No, you ain't going to get Stanley Park. The graveyard? You ain't going to get Stanley yes. Park. If I ever took a position in my life, that's it. <coughs> you no way you're going to get Stanley Park. Mm. We're still here, and we're still going to fight the issue. Let's keep it peaceful, eh? Gee, I've got to come back. Pity about it today. I'll be back after the break. Ten-second bulletin from Wyatt and a helicopter over Pemberton Meadows. Jack, the situation in Pepperton is worse now than it was yesterday. Most of the town is flooded except for the downtown portion, which is on the higher ground. But Thank you. Tomorrow flooded. at 9 a.m. precisely. The lefties on Vancouver City Council on check at midnight.